A few years ago, with the uh, arrival of cheap colour digital printing, someone had the bright idea of personalising uh, ch popular children's stories. Uh, you provide your name to them and then they do a find and replace on the hero of the story and, and then they push print. So uh, once upon a time there was a, a beautiful girl and she had long, long, long blonde hair and her name was Rapunzel. Oh, hang on, no, her name was Steph. Or, uh, well, when that happens, their story becomes your story. Well, there was another way they did it. Sometimes they just added your name to the story. Well, one day, Winnie the Pooh was walking along in with a hundred acre wood with his friends Piglet, Tigger and Seamus. His story became your story. Of course, these are made up stories. I don't imagine there was ever a child that said, Daddy, did this really happen? I don't remember this ever happening to me. But there is a true story a story from history where the story of the hero becomes our story. And we'll see in today's passage why that makes him enough as our Lord. Why don't we pray and then we'll dive into the passage. Heavenly Father, as we read your word together, would you apply it to our hearts? Your word is our comfort, your word is our rule, Lord, uh, we pray that we might have a deeper insight to what you have done for us in giving us our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. So I'm reading from Colossians uh, chapter 2, uh, verses 8 to 15. I'll be reading from the Christian Standard uh, Bible. Uh, that will be on the screen there, although you can read that in your own translation at home. So I'll be reading from verse 8. Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world, rather than Christ. For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ, and you have been filled by him, who is the head over every ruler and authority. You were also circumcised in him with a circumcision not done with hands, by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us, and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. But just before we do dive in, we need to see why Paul's about to tell us that his story is now our story. Well, the Colossians have been going well, but they're in some danger. Someone's been trying to tell them that they need simply more than Jesus as their Lord. We don't find out yet uh, what they think these things should be, but it doesn't really matter what it is. If you think you need to add anything to Jesus, you're believing a lie. It's an empty, man-made lie. In fact, it's come from the powers of darkness, and I think that's what elements of the world means, and not from Christ himself. So right now, Paul's about to say, this is what it means that his story is now your story. And when he's done, hopefully we'll see another reason why Jesus as your Lord is enough. We'll see how ridiculous it is to think you could add anything to Jesus is my Lord and that's enough. Well, kids, I've made a sheet uh, that you can tick every time I say, his story is now your story. I keep this next to whatever sheet you're doing um, because it's the one thing I want you and your family to remember today. And you can start right now because I'm at point three. His story is now your story. 
As I prepared this passage, I noticed it was similar to uh, one earlier from an earlier chapter uh, that begins, he is the image of the invisible God, talking about Jesus. Or they both speak about Jesus as God and him as head over all rulers and authorities and his reconciling death. Why is Paul telling us this again? What's new? Well, we are. It's still a story of Jesus, but this time it's about how his story is now our story. As we look at it, uh, we'll see the things that are at the heart of his story, what it means for him to be Lord, and how we've been swept up into that story. Now, we're not going to worry too much about the details. Let's just trace the thread of his story is now our story. So from verse 9, for the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. Now his story, well his story is that the man Jesus, in the man Jesus, we see the full package of what it means to be God. The one who has always been God has now also taken on humanity, taken up humanity. Now that sounds a little bit like Jesus is the invisible God uh, from the previous chapter, doesn't it? That's his story. But how is that now our story? Well, it's about fullness and completeness. Verse 10, And you have been filled by him who is the head over every ruler and authority. You see, there's nothing in Jesus that's missing in what it means to be fully God. So he's complete. And so by him, we're complete as well. We're full. Joined to Jesus, we're restored to completeness. There's nothing missing in what it means for us to be fully human. His story, fully, completely God. Our story, joined to him, by him, fully, completely human. What does that mean? Well, I think we're going to pick that up as we go along. For now, his story is now our story. Let's keep going. You are bound to have questions about this passage because we're not going through the details. So write them down now as you think of them and then put them in the comment box uh, at the end. So verse 11. You were also circumcised in him with a circumcision not done with hands, by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. Okay, so if you've done the study for this week, you're hoping I'm going to solve the mystery of this verse. Nope, sorry. It's okay to say it's not clear. And just to make it even less clear, if you're reading the NIV, it says either the circumcision done by Christ or the circumcision by Christ But literally, it's the circumcision of Christ. So it could be done by him, uh, it could be done to him. Uh, Some say Paul's talking about his crucifixion. It's not clear, is it? Well, what is clear is that his story is now our story. Let's see how. Well, the original circumcision was a sign of being one of the people of God, wasn't it? The removal of a piece of flesh by hand. It said... I am a member of God's chosen, Israel. So circumcision is a sign of being God's chosen. But Paul's talking about a circumcision of Christ. That's not a physical thing. Well, could it be something like this? First, his story. Christ is the one chosen by God. Remember, he's the true Israel. Remember, We learned that last year, didn't we, in Matthew. That's his story. Now, our story, we're circumcised in him, in Christ. And the body of flesh is put off. Uh, That's Paul's term for our old nature. And we're joined to Christ. We're joined to God's chosen. So our circumcision says we are one of God's chosen people in Christ. His story, he's the true people of God is now our story. In him, we are the true people of God. Well, whatever it does mean, 
and there are a few valid interpretations, you can see what Paul's doing. It was true for Christ, and now it's true for you. Or as they say, his story is now our story. And this circumcision, this putting off of the flesh, when did it happen? Verse 12, when you were buried with him in baptism. Oh, look, there's that with him language again. It's the story of his burial, so now it's the story of our burial. And baptism is a sign of it, isn't it? The sign of all that Jesus has done, the sign of the promises God makes to us in Christ, the sign that if we're joined to him, we're joined to what he's done. And here it's burial, it's death. We died and we died and we were buried to pay for our sin. Did you hear what I just said? Maybe you didn't. I'll say it again. We died and we died and we were buried to pay for our sin. We pay for our sin? Is that right? How could that be? Didn't Jesus die in our place? Wasn't Jesus our our substitute? Didn't he take the punishment so we didn't have to? Well, yes, absolutely he did. He did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He went through it because we couldn't. And so we do get the opposite of what we deserve. That's right. And it's usually the way that Paul and the Bible talks about it. But Paul's come from a different angle here in today's passage. Here Jesus' story is not separate from us, from our story, with him over there at the cross paying for our sin. In today's passage, his story is our story. Today we did go through that same passage down into burial here. We are joined to Jesus and so we went through what he did. His story is now our story. We'll keep going. From that same verse, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Now, I'm going to say this very carefully so you don't mishear me. From the angle of today's passage, Christ and us with the same story, it's right and it's just that we should be raised from the dead. It's right that we should be cleared of the charge of sinner. Why? Because joined to Christ, we have paid the penalty for sins. We have taken the death that sin deserves. And we were buried. As the head, so the body. So if we're buried with him, we're also raised with him. And again, again, there's that phrase, isn't there? We're joined to him through that whole journey. We are the Joey in the pouch or the passenger in the plane or as Bernard said to me this week, the sticky beak on the jeans. Where he goes, we go. And Paul's just told us here in this verse how we have come to have that same story. It's through faith, isn't it? Faith in the working of God. And what is the working of God? What's the work of God? The work of God is Christ. The man Christ is God working. When God gives us our Lord Jesus, that is God working to save us. And how do we benefit from that saving work? All the work that Jesus did to become our Lord How are we joined to that work, to our Lord? How does his story become our story? Well, let's just pause for a moment. What we're asking here is, how did a wretched, rebellious sinner on death row, that's you and me, how did we somehow become to be treated with the same privileges and the same status as the most precious, righteous and only Son of God, the Lord Jesus. That's what we're asking. How is it possible? How is it that that story 
became that story. Well, it's simply this. We said, God, you promised, I believe you. God, you said if I believe you sent Jesus for me, then he is for me. God, you said he's the Lord, he's all you need. And we said, yes, yes, he is. See, that's faith, isn't it? Taking God at his word, the word that Jesus is his gift to you as Lord, and living like it. A life that says, yes, Jesus as my Lord is enough. I can't add to that. I don't need to. So by faith, his story is now our story. But we do see something here of the old story, our old story, in verse 13. 13, and when you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. See, before his story became our story, before we were in him, we lived in Trespass Street and there was a sign at the edge of town saying, uncircumcision, population, not God's people. And that town's in the state of dead. That's where our story started, dead. But his story is one from, of life from death because death's only for people who are still in their trespasses. But joined to Jesus, those trespasses, our sins, are dealt with. So, of course, it's right that we would be made alive with him. And how are they dealt with? Well, here's where we really see what it means, even more deeply, to be joined to Jesus. Yes, we're joined to him, but he is also joined to us. And we've been saying uh, how his story becomes our story. But there was a time when our story became his story. You see, our old, our old story was written down. Not a diary or a memoir or a novel or some epic poem. Our story was an infinitely long legal document. And that document said, you are in the red. Your sins against God have put you so far into, the de into debt that you are unable to pay them. There's nothing you can do. In fact, with every breath you take, you sink deeper and deeper and deeper into debt. Every pen stroke on this document is against you. That's our story, written as a notice from the debt collector. But our story became his story. Our story of debt became his. Verse 14. He erased the certificate of debt, with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. See, the story of our debt becomes the story of Jesus. Jesus takes the debt on himself. Jesus becomes the debtor. As Jesus is nailed to the cross, his father is cancelling that debt. He's cancelling our debt. See, can you see how just how intertwined the life of our Lord and us is? Unless Jesus, as our Lord, became what we are, we could never become what he is, alive and righteous and pure in God's sight. His story became our story so that our story could become his story. How pathetic it would be, how ridiculous to look at all that he has done and say, yeah, I could improve on that or I have to be worthy somehow to get myself into that story. Friends, Jesus as Lord is enough. I'm at point four now. Jesus as Lord is enough and he's proud of it. Friends, all this is a bit much to take in, isn't it? All these things that Paul said we've done and, and been through, we look around at our lives and they don't look vastly different from the people around us. Sometimes in the week they do, church and 
praying with our family, some of those things. But the things we've been talking about this, this morning, the things that we've done, being circumcised and buried and raised, it's hard to believe it's actually true, isn't it? We might believe it, but it seems hidden. But it's not hidden to the unseen realms, including the powers of darkness. In fact, God made sure that it wasn't hidden to them. Well, why did he do that? Well, because this story, the story of how our story became his story, is God's favourite story to tell. It's the story of how his son becomes Lord, how as Lord he defeats his enemies, our enemies. And that's a story he wants known. Verse 15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly and he triumphed them, triumphed over them in him. See, the story of how he honours the ones joined to his son and it's a story of how he shames those who want to shame us, those dark powers. See, the father is proud of this story. It makes his son look good. And he's proud to honour the son and those who are caught up with him in his story. And the son is proud of that story. And he's proud to make it our story, his story, our story. He's proud to have us in him. So what do we, what do, we do with this? What's the application of his story is now our story? Well, here's a couple of questions. Question one. What difference would it make to you to know that the father right now looks at you in the same way he looks at his dear son, with the same affection, the same fatherly pride, the same status, the same privileges. Now what difference would that make to you when you're tempted to doubt his love for you or to think you need something to make yourself better before him or need something to make yourself complete? when you're tempted to doubt his power to look after you or his desire to look after you or when you're tempted to worry about what others think about you, looking down on you perhaps, what difference would it make that the father looks at you in the same way he looks at his son? Here's another question. What difference would it make to you to know why his story, the father, well, this father looks at you the same way he looks at his son. How his story became his, our story. What difference would it make to you when you're tempted to look down on others? Tempted to think that you could do something to make him think better of you. What difference would it make for you to know how it is that his story became our story? Well, friends, Jesus, as your Lord, has a story that should leave you in no doubt about the way his Father feels about him. But Jesus has taken you through that same story. And so we ought to have no doubt about the way that the Father thinks about us. He looks at you and he sees someone who is forgiven and reconciled. That is what it means to be fully, completely human and reconciled like and like his son, pure, complete and victorious. Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have made his story our story. And the way that you look about, look at your son, the way you think about him is now the way you think and feel and look at those who are joined to him. Father, would you give us such peace and such humility when we think about that by your spirit. Would you apply it to our hearts? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.